for me, this image really epitomizes the reason why, if we want to be able to study the oceans and, their, and their monitor their health, we have to use observations from space. Everything you can see in this image is ocean. This is the North Pacific, as seen from the International Space Station. And so clearly, if we want to be able to study these vast areas, then we have to make use of uh, observations such as sat from satellites from space. So my name is Jamie Shuttler and I'm from the University of Exeter and I'm going to be talking about some of the recent advances we made in using satellite Earth observation for studying the marine carbonate system uh, and ocean acidification. And this is work that I've done with all the colleagues that are lifted, listed at the bottom left and our institutes are listed on the right. And much of this work has been funded by the European Space Agency. So we first identified this potential for using satellite observations for studying the marine uh, carbonate system back in 2015. And this was around the time that the first satellite-based observations of salinity were being becoming available. And we knew that there was a strong link between salinity and the marine carbonate system. And so when you combine that with the already established ability to monitor and study water temperature from space, it meant you could then actually start to describe and understand and study the marine carbonate system. Then more recently, we also uh, did a large review with the International Working Group, where we not only identified some of the opportunities, which I'm going to talk about, and we, we have now explored some of the initial results from those I'm going to talk about in a second, but we also identified uh, a number of other places, another other advancements which would be possible. So this work is very much at the beginning. There are many more advancements that we could still make. And around the time of our f the first publication, when we identified the opportunity that, uh, of using satellite salinity observations, we received quite a lot of press coverage. And here's an example. Uh, headline, Ocean Acidification Now Watchable in Real Time. So while the, the, the kind of essence of that is correct, we can observe the carbon system from space using satellites. We can't do it in, the re in, in real time. So the, the, you know, the, the, the detail of, of that headline isn't quite right. So the first work we did was looking at, we looked at particular regions around the globe and we wanted to identify not only how precise and how accurate uh, satellite observation methods could be, but also we wanted to look for the optimal approaches. Uh, so we assessed not only satellite salinity observations, but we also looked at lots of other sources of salinity data as well and then assessed them all. Now this work means that you can then start to reconstruct the carbonate system. So you can see we, we can estimate alkalinity and dissolved inorganic carbon here. You can see that on the top two animations. And at the bottom we've got the original salinity data. And this is the North Atlantic and you can see the plume of the Amazon coming out from the land and then flowing into the ocean. So this is work that we published and we studied not only the Amazon area but we also looked at the Greater Caribbean, the Bay of Bengal uh, and also globally. But what was particularly exciting about this piece of work was it enabled us uh, to actually study the whole carbonate system. So once we have two of the carbonate system parameters, we can then combine that with our salinity data, our water temperature data and pressure, because we know we're looking at surface waters. And that enables us to then calculate the whole carbonate system, which means for the first time, for example, you can have synoptic scale observational based data of North Atlantic pH. So you can see that on the on the right and you can see the low pH waters of the Amazon flowing out into the Atlantic. So that was really the basis of where the Ocean Soda project started from. So Ocean Soda starts, stands for Satellite Data Sets for Ocean Acidification. And within this project, we expanded our focus quite a lot. We looked in the global case, but we also had a number of different regions we uh, focused on, which predominantly were upwelling regions and also river influenced regions. And then in addition to that, we also have a focus in Arctic waters. So each of these coloured blocks represents a different component of the work within the Ocean Soda project. And each of them has both a scientific component and also a downstream or an impact uh, focus piece of work. So the scientific component is about the algorithm development or the technological advancement that provides and enables us to produce a set of data. 
whether that be global or uh, and time series or regional and time series. And then we have the impact or downstream analysis, which is the point where we actually exploit and use those data for some sort of real world application. And all of this work was uh, guided um, by representatives from WWF and also from NOAA to ensure that what we're doing is relevant to uh, both the scientific community, but also the potential user communities. So the first area we looked at was extreme acidification and compound events. This meant that we had to develop the capability for producing long time series, global observation-based data sets of the carbonate system. And then these have uh, since been used as Nikki, who's going to be talking uh, in, a, in a few minutes, will, it, will explain how, how they're being used to study compound events. So this is an example uh, map, global map of pH. You can see the red dot, uh, the location just off the west coast of North America. And these, these, this approach, these, these data that we, we've, uh, we are now able to produce allows us to be able to study the pH through time for a particular location and therefore be able to identify uh, when that particular location is experiencing extreme conditions. Another area we've looked at is uh, large river outflows. So this is particularly focused on the Amazon and on the Congo. For, and first of all, we want to identify the optimal approaches for studying those riverine uh, regions, riverine influence regions. And then it allowed us to actually be able to study how carbon and quantify how much carbon is flowing from the land into the ocean from those rivers, but also how those rivers are affecting uh, and influencing the carbonate system in tropical reef environments. So at the bottom here, you can see a picture of the Amazon plume. And then labelled, we have our different areas, marine protected areas and uh, coral reefs. And using the time series data, we're then able to identify which reefs are being influenced strongly by the river and therefore experiencing the highly variable carbonate system conditions. And from that, <coughs> that helps us understand how they may change or how they may um, uh, react to long-term changes in the marine carbonate system versus coral reefs, uh, the ones in red, which are uh, experiencing very stable and very, uh, um, very low variability carbonate system conditions. So this kind of information can help guide and support conservation efforts. We've also looked at upwelling systems. This is using wind speed data. So here, if we know the wind conditions along uh, coastlines, we can actually use that information to understand how much water is being drawn up from below, how much, is, how much water is being upwelled, and then how much water is actually being uh, transported offshore. And we have been able to verify that our upwelling flows, both vertically and horizontally, are consistent with the observed changes in the pH within these regions. And, and so this kind of information has uh, clear use within fisheries and understanding how fish stocks are likely to be impacted uh, in the future as our uh, climate continues to change. We have also included some work on the Arctic. And so we had a PhD student who's associated with the project, Hannah, who will be talking, also be talking in, in a few minutes. And she focused in on Arctic waters. Now, the first part of her PhD was about identifying economically important fish stocks which live in these Arctic uh, waters. And also, we wanted to understand how much we knew about uh, how ocean acidification is affecting, currently affecting, their different life stages. Um, and it turns out we know very little. And so it's quite clear from her work that satellite observations are needed to understand the variability and, and the baseline conditions that these animals are currently existing before, and that would allow us to then understand how uh, they're likely to be impacted uh, in the future by future changes in the marine carbon system. And so that's work that Anna will be talking about in a few minutes. Towards the end of the project, we actually had a stakeholder workshop. And the idea here was to try and uh, increase the connective um, elements between us, our, our new advancements and how they could be used by actual user groups and stakeholders. This was a completely online workshop. We had more than uh, 50 international participants from all over the world. So we held it in two half-day slots to allow people from different time zones to all connect. 
And we had keynote talks from the International Union for Conservation of Nature, from Ocean Conservancy, the Ocean Acidification Alliance, and also the GOA Observing Network. And it was quite clear from those from the workshop that the, the we end the we end we can actually group uh, stakeholders and users into three different groups that have fundamentally different uses for the for the data the kind of data we can provide. So we can have policy makers and elected officials, resource managers, and end users. So the policy makers they're really un interested in understanding the variability on very broad scales uh, around their regions. Uh, and, and, that, uh, and those kind of data could then help them understand drivers of change. And, and they can also be used for highlighting the issue. So, for example, US or North American states um, policymakers can use this kind of the information we provide from satellites to help highlight the th potential threat to their region if they want to highlight to the higher levels of government. Resource managers, so this is more regional or state level. They can use the kind of these kind of observation data that we can provide for identifying susceptible regions for helping to target management. Whereas more sort of a, a, the lower sort of smaller uh, organisations or near coast companies, such as sh uh, shellfish farms, for example. They already have a very high level of knowledge of the marine carbon system, but they wouldn't necessarily have the, high, uh, the similar experience in using Earth observation data and, and interpretation of those data. So therefore, clearly, if they were to want to use the kind of data we can provide, then they, we have to provide some sort of training. And clearly, these groups also have a very near shore interest, whereas much of the work we've done so far, I would say uh, most of the work we've done so far is very much offshore. And so uh, at the moment, this is th these are uh, very much where the work is uh, progressing. We are now beginning to engage with some of these groups and with the help of the Ocean Certification Alliance, we're now working or have begun working with a, a group of resource managers uh, in the east coast uh, of North America, so the Pacific Coast Collaborative, to try and ensure that what we're producing from our research, the data sets uh, that we're pr producing are usable for, for their needs. I just wanted to end on some of the possible future advancements. I said at the beginning that we're, we're very much at the beginning of this work. With our current, the advancements we've made recently, such as those I've just described in this talk, we have the potential for, for moving down to about 25 kilometer spatial resolution and an eight day observational uh, based data set. So currently we're, the work I've presented is all monthly and one degree, so it's about 110 kilometers uh, resolution. But we, we can see that with these current approaches, we could go down to about 25 kilometers and eight days. However, in the, new, in the near future, one particular advancement is the Copernicus Imaging Microwave Radiometer, which is a proposed satellite mission. The, the first one's supposed to be launched in 2025, and there'll be three of these in orbit, so it's about operational uh, use. They're actually being uh, developed initially to focus on the Arctic. But they have hold the capability of actually providing 25 kilometer, kilometer spatial resolution data or less, but on a daily basis. So really, the you know, the the in the near future, the the opportunities and the the potential of these Earth observation data sets and the potential uses for them is really going to gr uh, grow quite considerably. So I'd just like to end on these are all the references that I have uh, referred to within this talk, and so you can pause the video if you want and actually look at those in detail. Uh, and and thank you very much for listening.